Okay, do you like board games? Yes, no, show of hands, actually. Do you like board games? Okay, enough of you to make this worth saying. Good. I remember liking board games in a previous season of life where it didn't seem like there were other things that were more important than board games, but I really remember liking them a lot. And when you approach a new board game, some t you don't just dive right in and start doing, right? When you've never played a game before, you need either someone who's played before or you need to actually find that piece of paper in the box that actually explains how to play the game. It can take quite a while to learn all the rules, to learn the turn-based uh, instructions, to learn the strategy then of how to play well. But before any of that, there's one thing you need to know. Everything else in terms of gameplay or in terms of strategy serves the ultimate purpose. You gotta know how to win the game. In Risk, destroy all your enemies and conquer the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Candyland, be the first one to the end of the board where you get to like, what is it, gumdrop? I don't even know what castle it is. It's Candyland. Or in Settlers, 10 victory points. 10 little victory points. Everything you do has to serve the purpose of the win. Uh, which is why I regularly, regularly beat my son Trey at Settlers. Uh, he's six. <laughs> but he loves playing the soldier card. And if you know Settlers, you know that when you play the soldier card, you get to move the robber and you get to take a resource card from one of your opponents. He doesn't care about how to win the game. He just loves to take a card from his dad. <laughs> And that's partly because when he does, I roll around on the ground in freakish agony, moaning as though I've just been stabbed by a dagger or something. And he loves the overreaction, so he spends his whole game saving up enough to buy development cards so that he can buy, get a soldier card, so he can steal one of my resources and leave me wallowing in freakish misery on the ground. Which is why I always win. It's so great. <laughs> He's busy soldier carding me, and I'm busy racking up victory points and building cities on my settlements and just kicking bum. So, which, okay, then we get far enough in the game that we combine forces, and then we go after 20 victory points together, because I'm not going to beat my six-year-old, but inside I know I won. <laughs> I'm not saying that being the church is the equivalent to just a game. But if it was... We're trying to live faithfully as God's people. We're trying to do church. We're trying to be the church together. We need to understand, first and foremost, what it looks like to win the game. What is it that we're trying to do? This is a question about mission. What is it that we're trying to do, what to, to accomplish? How do we win? We need to have a clear picture of the win in our mind. And so we need to open a window on the mission of the church in order to remember the goal of the game. Why we're running around doing all these crazy things that we're doing. What is the mission of the church? You know, actually, a lot of churches have mission statements. Turns out, quick search on Google, almost every church has a mission statement, and I'm sure they're all incredible. In fact, let me share some of them with you, because I know this is riveting information. Uh, there's a church in uh, Memphis, Tennessee called High Point, and their mission is to love God, to love people, and make disciples. Sounds good. I like it. Uh, here's the Rock Church in San Diego, California. Only in San Diego. Uh, save, equip, and send out a highly motivated army, and then it got too long and I lost interest. <laughs> Three Rivers in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Inward, outward, upward. Okay, uh, Here's Red Rock Church in Colorado to connect with God, to connect with others, and then to connect others to God. I like it. Love, grow, serve. All saints in Virginia. And actually that one, there's about 400 churches that have that one. You can just keep scrolling down the page to see all the churches that have love, grow, serve. Isn't it interesting how all of these are actually pretty much saying the same thing? Take a glance at those for a second. You've got love God, there's the God piece. Love people, there's the other's piece. And then the make disciples, there's sort of a growing element in there. Isn't that sort of like upward and outward and inward? Or love and grow and serve? Or connect with God, connect with others, and connect others to God? Or save, equip, and set? Like you see, there's, there seems to be these three elements that repeat again and again in church mission statements, no matter how hard they try to be innovative and creative. Are they all just recycling? 
On the one hand, one might lament this sameness. Seriously, you can't come up with anything more original than what everybody else already said? Can't they find unique, original expressions? Their own special way of being? Here's another one. Uh, Gateway Church, South Lake, Texas, to bring people to Jesus and membership in His family and to develop them to Christ-like maturity and equip them for their ministry in the church and life and mission in the world in order to glorify God's name. Okay. It's longer, more impressive. Same three things, though. You've got the, the glorify God's name. You've got this, this piece that focuses on the glory of God. You've got this growing, developing to maturity and equipping. And then you've got this bringing people to Jesus and mission in the world. You've got this outward... See, what I mean? they all sound the same. But, but aren't we unique? As a church, aren't we trying to offer something unique to the world? Aren't we trying to do something different? So what's our mission statement? Do you even know our mission statement? Let me help out with that. I just happen to have it here, conveniently. We exist to exalt God, to equip His church, and to extend His grace into the world. This is our mission statement. This is our win. This is the mission of Community Church of East Gloucester. This is who we are. But wait a minute. Isn't that the same as what everybody else is saying? They're the same three things again, right? Exalt God. There's the upward. We want God in the highest place in our lives. Right? So exalting Him means to love Him, to delight in Him, to enjoy a relationship with Him, and to allow Him, all of life, gets oriented under His glory and for His glory. Exalting God is the same as loving God, is the same as upward, it's the same as... You see what I'm saying? And then you get to the equipping, and we do the equipping as church. Well, that's the same as growing to maturity. That's the same as developing. That's the same as teaching to use gifts. That's, but that's what church should be, right? We're to be growing together towards Christ-likeness, towards holiness, as we seek to extend His grace. There's the third one, and there's the outward. There's the serve. There's the, the, the evangelism. There's the proclamation of the glory of Christ and His saving grace in the world. Exalt, equip, extend, love, grow, serve, save, equip, send, bring, develop, mission, inward, outward, upward. What makes us different, though, from all these other churches? Nothing. And would you believe that's on purpose? Why is there no difference between us and all these other churches? Because these mission statements are biblical. It, they all sound the same because the mission of the church is not up to the church. The mission of the church is not something we get to invent for ourselves as a, as a mechanism of self-expression and innovation in the world. The mission of the church is described biblically. The church was God's idea, not ours. He is the one who described what it's supposed to be. He is the one who establishes its mission. He is the one who defines the win. He wrote the rules. The mission of the church should be an unchanging reality defined biblically by God and not us. So, to a real extent, the mission of every church should be the same. And we can choose a different letter for alliteration, or we can choose a different metaphor through which to express it. But we should be able to see these three facets. Every church should have a very similar mission, which we just happen to have chosen to express this way. So there's nothing special, unique, magical, or distinct even about this mission. What we're saying is we stand together with churches around the globe. We stand together with churches throughout history of exalting God, equipping His church, and extending the grace of Jesus Christ into a broken and hurting world. It's the difference between a little C church and a capital C church. And we stand together as part of the capital C church in partnership and in common mission with the church throughout history and around the world. I think that's cool. I think it's healthy to remember it's not actually all about us. I think it's healthy to remember we play by God's rules, not by our rules. And that we're not the only ones in the game. So but where, where do these three things come from? They sound really good, but we should probably take a moment to show them to you in the Scriptures. So let's get to the Word. The two places these, these ideas come from best 
are actually two teachings of Jesus. It's the great commandments that we see in Matthew 22 and the great commission that we see in Matthew 28. You might be familiar with these texts. They're pretty fa- popular. They're pretty fabulous. But if you're not, even if you are, it's worth seeing them again. Because together, these two teachings of Jesus form pretty much the entire basis of who the church is called to be. So you're welcome to turn there in your Bibles. I am going to put the Scriptures on the screen this week. Uh, so let's start with Matthew 22 and the greatest commandments. All right, as we get into the Word, you've got to get yourself into the scene. Jesus is walking around in ministry. He's going from city to city, from village to village, proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. But he was also kind of upending the status quo of the religious establishment and kind of making people mad all over the place too, especially religious leaders who had a nice tight system set up. And so the Pharisees, those religious leaders, were constantly following him around, trying to trap him, trying to discredit him, trying to undermine the things that Jesus was saying. And so this account here in Matthew 22, the Pharisees were again trying to trap Jesus in order to discredit him, trying to lure him into saying something they could find fault with. And one of them, in verse 35, an expert in the law, no less, tests Jesus with this question. He says, O teacher... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And there, the trap is set. Right? Because I don't know if you've read the Old Testament, but there's a lot of laws. And maybe you've tried, you know, maybe to read the Bible in a year or something like that. How many of you made it past Leviticus? I didn't the first like seven tries. But in the mind of a Pharisee trying to trap Jesus, if Jesus says that law number 122 is the most important, Well, we can attack him for devaluing laws 1 through 121 and anything from 123 forward. Like, whatever Jesus answers, we're going to be able to criticize him for devaluing part of God's law. Whatever Jesus answers will provide ammunition to his opponents. Except for what Jesus actually answers. Because Jesus is God himself in human form. He wrote the law. He gave the law. This guy thought he was an expert in the law. He didn't know what the word expert meant. This is Jesus' answer to the trap. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, those like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Boom! Mic drop. Jesus just destroys the competition. Why? Because in answering like this, Jesus didn't single out specific laws to value over others. He chose Old Testament laws that summarized the entirety of Old Testament law. Jesus chose laws that summarize, that encapsulate, that capture the heart and spirit of everything that the Old Testament was calling God's people to pursue. Right? And it all starts with loving God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It all starts with elevating God, worshiping Him, enjoying Him, delighting in Him, putting Him in the highest place in your life. Man, that sounds an awful lot like exalt. Bang, we have our first E right here in the text. You want to know what the church is supposed to be doing? You know what the win is? We need to be exalting God and putting Him in the highest place. Jesus said so. The text continues, and the second is like it. Jesus never plays by anyone else's rules, so when asked for one commandment, He gives two. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so there we have the call to act lovingly, not just to conjure warm, fuzzy feelings towards our neighbors, but to do loving things for our neighbors, whether they deserve it or not, whether they are like us or not, whether they agree with us or not, that every human being has value because they're created in the image of God and therefore are worthy of love and dignity and respect. And so Jesus says you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself which sounds a lot like extending God's grace to others. Extending God's grace into an unbelieving world. And grace, by its definition, is unmerited favor. It's choosing to love someone who hasn't done anything to earn it and doesn't deserve it. 
That's how God loves us, and so we're called to extend that same approach to loving others. And in just these two commandments, we find the first E of exalt and the third E of extend. These are the greatest commandments of the entire Old Testament. These are the commandments that are reaffirmed in the New Testament. These are the commandments for the people of God according to Jesus. So they should be fairly directive for us as a church. And that takes us sort of that walks us through the greatest commandments that Jesus gives us. And that's one moment that we need to look to. There's a second moment though that we look to in terms of the great commission. And in this text, this is after Jesus has suffered and died for our sins. This is after he's been buried. This is after he rose from the grave. And he appears to his disciples. And this is sort of just before he ascends back into heaven. So what we have here are sort of famous last words. And last words are important words. You want your last words to be really significant and pithy and really memorable. Jesus accomplished that. These are Jesus' last words. Matthew 28, 18-20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is a last words moment. So let's unpack this a little bit. How does this contribute to what we're called to be? What, how does this contribute to the win here at Community Church? Well, we see here in this first sentence, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here Jesus is saying exaltation is due. He's saying I am the top dog. I am the Alpha, the Omega. I am God Himself. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here is a reinforcement of the idea that our lives and as a church our purpose is to exalt God. And the extend is here too. Go and make disciples of all nations. There's that opportunity to extend the good news that Jesus saves and to share that with everyone, not to force or, or, or require conversion, but that so everyone might have a chance to hear and respond. We, we have a clear statement of extension of the grace of God into the world. But in this great commission, I think Jesus knows something else. That we're all under construction. And that it's not enough simply to believe and be baptized as though now I'm suddenly going to be perfect. But that there's a process of becoming Christ-like. A process of being made holy that the Spirit accomplishes in our lives. And so this third aspect of the great commission is an instruction to the church to teach to obey everything Jesus has commanded. And here we see this equipping piece that the church is supposed to be a place where we grow together, where we're teaching and where we're learning, and where we're teaching one another and we're learning from one another. right? And so when you put these things together, even in this one great commission, Jesus' last words, we see all three aspects of the mission of the church to exalt God, to equip one another, and to extend His grace into an unbelieving world. This is the mission of the church. It's why we phrase it this way at Community Church. And it's why so many other churches, we see the same elements repeated again and again. It's biblical. God wrote the rules for what it means to be a church. So we choose to play by His rules. But remember the board game analogy. If we go back to Settlers... There's one more aspect of that illustration that needs to be brought into play because these different aspects could be argued that this is how you play the game. Each turn, you have the chance to play a development card, you have a chance to roll the dice, you have a chance to collect your resources, and you have a chance to make purchases. Okay, those are the four things you do every turn. You could argue that these are the three things we're supposed to do every turn. Right? To exalt God, to equip one another, and to extend His grace. But remind me what the win is. Like, how do you actually win the game? Ten points, thank you. Yes. <laughs> ah, good to have you here, Shatswell. <laughs> the beauty is that Jesus won the game for us. Right? So it's not about our human striving. 
And this is where he concludes his great commission. He says, surely I am with you always to the end of the age because there's nothing you can do to conjure my presence. No amount of good works will get you into my presence. There's nothing you can do to earn it, to win it, to deserve it. And even if you're exalting and equipping and extending, it's still not enough to cover your sin, so I'm going to cover it for you. And that's the free gift that Jesus offers. And the win here is the very presence of the living Christ in our lives. That we might know Christ and enjoy a relationship with Him every day of our lives, even to the end of the age. This is the win. And Jesus accomplished it for us. So, how do we take hold of this? How do we make this matter? What does this look like in our lives? Well, the answer to that comes in remembering 3D TV. Remember when everyone thought 3D TV was going to be the next rage? That was a great, like, three weeks. (laughs) But the idea being putting on funny glasses or whatever and having a weird way of filming things that breaks down the yellow and green and creates depth Right? It doesn't seem to have panned out, but sometimes a movie comes along where 3D is really how you have to see it. I remember seeing uh, Jurassic something or other in 3D. And you know the tension, and you know there's a velociraptor somewhere, but it's off screen somewhere, and the music is getting crazy, and you're getting tense. And then when it comes at you, and when it comes at you in 3D, right into your face, I mean, you jump, your heart rate goes up, your body floods the system with adrenaline, you're, you, and you hope people near you didn't see how much you jumped. The, the, for a movie like that, a flat two-dimensional image just doesn't do it justice. Right? There's a depth, there's an immersive quality to a 3D experience that can't be matched by a 2D movie that makes sense. Three dimensions beats two dimensions. By comparison, a 2D film is just flat. Does your life seem a little flat? I think we're supposed to be living a 3D experience of life. I mean, this is what Jesus says in John 10, right? I've come that you might have life and have it in sort of a flatline, apathetic way. In case you thought that was the quote, it wasn't. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Jesus is offering a 3D life, not just a 2D life, a 3D life, one that jumps off the screen. I propose to you that the key to experiencing a 3D life is to experience a 3E life. I'm sorry, that's just corny, but we're we're going there anyways. A 3E life. If you want life to jump off the screen, if you want to experience the presence of Christ in your life, enjoying God and being part of His kingdom purposes in the world, then we need to be chasing after a 3E life because this is what it looks like to live missionally, right? So even just personally, in your own walk with the Lord, consider how you measure up, how you might fulfill, how you see these three E's manifesting themselves in your life. If we're opening a window onto the people we're supposed to be, what does this look like? What does exalting God look like in your life? I mean, we worship together on Sunday morning. Are you throwing yourself wholeheartedly into worship? Are you unfettered and unchained in worship? Do you worship with reckless abandon to the extent that your freedom actually provides freedom for others around you? Worship is an action. It's something we do together. And let's do it with reckless abandon. But it's also more than just an action. It's also a lifestyle. A life of worship is one that is lived in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. A life that is gradually but systematically and with forward progress being conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Are we moving forward as we exalt God with our whole lives? What does being equipped look like? Are you growing? When you look back over this last year of your life, Is it a flat line? Is it two dimensions? Or are you growing? And if you're not growing, why not? Is there a way that you can once again, are there steps you can take to re-engage in something that will help you grow? Whether that's just meeting with another person and saying, this faith thing is feeling kind of flat right now. You want to get together every once in a while and just talk Jesus and pray for each other and let's see what happens. Let's take a step towards a 3D life. Join a small group. Join an accountability partnership. Get involved in a ministry team 
where you're working together for God's glory and you might just find life springs from 2D to 3, from 2E to 3. Or what does extending God's grace into the world look like? Are you getting to know your neighbors? Are you demonstrating their value by inviting them in, by maybe for dinner or for serving them, watching their kids from time to time, or sharing with anyone how much Jesus means to you and what He's done for you? We need to each individually be living a 3E life. But we also recognize that the goal is not that we each individually stay individual, but we have gathered together as a church. And together there's a reality that we need to become a 3E church. All dimensions jumping off the screen in our experience of life together as a church. So, if we're going to be exalting God, what does it look like to participate in worship fully here? What does it look like? Are you tithing regularly as an act of worship? Not because the church keeps asking you for your money, but because you recognize everything you have comes from God. And the Bible is filled with examples of saying part of the way we tell God how important He is is by giving from what we have back to Him. It's like a first fruits thing. Are you encouraging others around you to live a whole life of worship? Uh, Equipping. It's one thing to ask, am I growing? It's another thing to say, and how am I helping somebody else around me grow closer to Jesus? What does that look like? Church might not just be the place for the consumer, it might also be a place for someone to be a discipler. And that sounds like a big, scary, fancy word. And really, it just means, how are you helping others around you grow closer to Jesus? And that can be as informal as coffee or hanging out when your kids are playing soccer together. It, there's no rules for how this is done. How are you, maybe you're part of a ministry team that equips others. Maybe you're part of a small group that equips others. How about extending His grace in the world? How are you helping our church find practical and tangible ways of loving people and serving the city He's placed us in? How are you helping us as a church minister to the least of these in our cities? And are we daring together to share the love and grace of Christ? Again, not just to convert people, but in relevant and meaningful ways that offer them the truth of Jesus should they ever find themselves looking for more. We're called to be this kind of church. This is our mission. But we also have to remember that even as we go crazy busy trying to accomplish this mission, we have to remember the win. And the win, that we cannot miss the end game. So busy playing soldier cards because it's fun that we forget to collect the victory points. The game is not won by being the busiest church. The game is not won by having the coolest worship or by having the best preaching or by having the awesomest small groups, by having the most visible or trendy outreach. The game is won as we draw close to Jesus and as we experience His presence in our life because Jesus alone saves. It's He who has given us our marching orders. This is who we are. This is our mission. This is our win. This is what we are trying to do at Community Church. This is who we are. And we are a people under construction. So this is also who we're trying to be. And when you take both of those things together, God has declared this is your identity. And then there's our response. So we're going to chase after that with all of our hearts. There's the picture of the 3E life. There's the picture of the 3E church. This is the mission of Community Church. So come grow with us. Here's the invitation to you. Go home this afternoon and line your life up against the three E's. Go home this afternoon and ask the question, am I experiencing the win that Jesus has accomplished for us? Come grow as an individual into a three E life. And this fall, come grow with us as a church into a three E church. Let's grow together to become the kind of church that God is calling us to be. Let's pray together.